welcome back. And now I get to share with you chapter 11, which is also my story, the bedtime story. Listen then, I said, settling down with Michael at my feet and the seven boys in the bed. There was once a gentleman. I'd rather he had been a lady, Curly said. I wish he had been a white rat, said Nibs. Quiet, I cautioned them. There was a lady also. And, oh, mummy, cried the first twin. You mean that there is a lady also, don't you? She is not dead, is she? Oh, no. Well, I'm awful glad she isn't dead, said Tootles. Are you glad, John? Of course I am. Are you glad, Nibs? Rather. Are you glad, twins? We are glad. Oh, dear, I sighed. A little less noise there, Peter called out, determined that I should have my fair play, however beastly a story it might be in his opinion. Now, the gentleman's name, I continued, was Mr. Darling, and her name was Mrs. Darling. I knew them, John said to annoy the others. I think I knew them, said Michael rather doubtfully. They were married, you know, I explained. And what do you think they had? White rats, cried Nims inspired. No. <laughs> It's awfully puzzling, said Tootles, although he knew the story by heart. Quiet, Tootles. They had three descendants. What is descendants? Well, you are one, twin. Did you hear that, John? I am a descendant. Descendants are only children, said John. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Now, these three children had a fateful nurse called Nana. But Mr. Darling was angry with her and chained her up in the yard. So, all the children flew away. It's an awful good story, said Nibs. They flew away to the Neverland where the lost children are. I just thought they did, Curly broke out excitedly. I don't know how it is. But I just thought they did. Wendy, cried Tootles. Was one of the lost children called Tootles? Yes, he was. I'm in the story. Hurrah! I'm in the story, Nibs. Hush. Now, I want you to consider the feelings of the unhappy parents with all their children flown away. Oh, they moaned though they were not really considering the feelings of the unhappy parents in one jolt. Think of the empty beds. Oh, it's awfully sad, the first twin said. I don't see how it can have a happy ending, said the second twin. Do you, Nibs? Well, I'm frightfully anxious. If you knew how great is a mother's love, I told them triumphantly, then you would have no fear. I now came to the part that Peter hated the most. I do like a mother's love, said Tootles, hitting Nibs with the pillow. Do you like a mother's love, Nibs? I do just, said Nibs, hitting back. Well, you see, as I said complacently, our heroine knew that the mother would always leave the window open for her children to fly back by. And so they stayed away for years and had a lovely time. Did they ever go back? Let us now, I said, bracing myself up for my finest effort, take a peep into the future. And they all gave themselves a twist that makes peeps into the future easier. Years have rolled by, and who is this elegant lady 
of uncertain age alighting at London Station. Oh, Wendy, who is she? cried Nips, every bit as excited as if he didn't know. Can it be? No. Yes, it is the fair Wendy. Ooh. And who are the noble two portly figures accompanying her? Now grown to a man's estate. Can they be John and Michael? Well, yes, they are. Ooh. You see, dear brothers, there is a window still standing open. And now we are rewarded of our sublime faith in a mother's love. And so up they flew to their mummy and daddy, and pen cannot describe the happy scene over which we draw a veil. And that was the story. And they were as pleased with it as I was myself. Everything just as it should be, you see. Off we skip like the most heartless things in the world, which is what children are, but so attractive. And we have a entirely selfish time. And then we have need of special attention, which we nobly return for, confident that we shall be rewarded instead of smacked. So great indeed was our faith in a mother's love that we felt we could afford to be callous for a bit longer. But there was one there who knew better. And when I finished, he uttered a hollow groan. Peter, what is it? I cried, running to him, thinking that he was ill. I felt him over solicitously and felt for his chest. Where is it, Peter? It isn't that kind of pain, Peter replied darkly. Well, then what kind is it? Wendy, you are wrong about mothers. We all gathered around him affright. So alarming was his agitation. And with a fine candor, he told us what he had hitherto concealed. Long ago, he said, I thought like you, that my mother would always keep the window open for me. So I stayed away for moons and moons and moons and then flew back. But the window was barred for mother had forgotten all about me. And there was another little boy sleeping in my bed. I am not sure that this was true, but Peter thought it was true and it scared us. Are you sure mothers are like that? Yes. So this was the truth about mothers, the toads. Still, it is best to be careful, and no one knows so quickly as a child when he should give in. Wendy, let's go home, cried John and Michael together. Yes, I said, clutching them. Well, not tonight, asked the lost boys, bewildered. They knew in what they called their mother, their hearts, that one can get on quite well without a mother, but it was the only mother who f you think you can't. At once, I replied resolutely, and for the horrible thought had to come to me, perhaps mother is in half mourning by this time. This dread made me forget what must be Peter feeling, and I said to him rather sharply, Peter, will you make the necessary arrangements? If you wish it, he replied as coolly as if I had asked him to pass the nuts. Not so much as a sorry to lose you between us, but of course he cared very much, and he was so full of wrath against grown-ups who, as usual, were spoiling everything. But as soon as he got inside his tree, he breathed intentionally, quick, short breaths, 
and the rate of about five to a second. He did this because there was a saying in Neverland that every time you breathe, a grown-up dies. And Peter was trying to kill them off vindictively as fast as possible. Then, having given the necessary instructions to the natives, he returned to the home where an unworthy scene had been enacted in his absence. Panic-stricken at the thought of losing me, the lost boys, had advanced upon me threateningly. It'll be worse than before she came, they cried. Then we shan't let her go. Let's keep her prisoner. I chain her up. In my extremity, an instinct told me to which of them to turn. Toodles, I cried. I appeal to you. Was it not strange? I appeal to Toodles, quite the silliest one. But grandly, however, did Toodles respond. For at one moment, he dropped his silliness and spoke with dignity. I am just Toodles, he said, and nobody minds me. But the first who does not behave to Wendy like an English gentleman I will blood him severely. He drew back his hanger, and for that instant his sun was at noon. The others held back uneasily. And then Peter returned, and they saw at once that they would get no support from him. He would keep no girl in the Neverland against his will. Wendy, he said, striding up and down. I have asked the natives to guide you through the wood, as flying tires you so. Thank you, Peter. Then he continued, in the short, sharp voice of one accustomed to be in a maid. Tinkerbell will take you across the sea. Wake her up, Nibs. Nibs had to knock twice before he got an answer, though Tink had really been sitting up in bed listening for quite some time. Who are you? How dare you? Go away, she cried. You are to get up, Tink, Nibs called, and take Wendy on a journey. Of course, Tinks had been delighted to hear that I was going, but she was delighted, well, determined not to be my courier. And she said so in more offensive language. Then she pretended to fall asleep again. She says she won't, Tibbs, ex Nibs exclaimed, exhaust at such an insubordination, where Peter went sternly to the young lady's chamber. Tink, he rapped out, if you don't get up and dress at once, I will open the curtains and then we shall all see you in your negligee. And this made her leap to the floor. Who said I wasn't getting up? She cried. In the meantime, the boys were gazing very forlornly at me, now equipped with John and Michael for the journey. But this time they were dejected, not merely because they were about to lose me, but also because they felt that I was going off to something nice to which they had not been invited. Novelty was beckoning them as usual. Crediting them with a nobler feeling, I melted. Dear ones, I said, if you will all come with me, I feel almost sure I can get my father and mother to adopt you. This invitation was meant specifically for Peter, but each of the boys was thinking exclusively of himself, and at once they jumped with joy. But won't they think us rather a handful? Nebs asked in the middle of his jump. Oh no, I said, rapidly thinking it out. It will only mean having a few beds in the drawing room, but they could be hidden behind the screens on first Thursdays. Peter, can we go? They all cried imploringly, and they took it granted that if they went, he would go also. But really, they were scarcely cared. Thus, children are ever ready when novelty knocks 
to desert their dearest ones. All right, Peter replied with a bitter smile, and immediately they rushed to get their things. And now, Peter, I said, thinking I had put everything right, I'm going to give you your medicine before you go. I love to give them medicine, and undoubtedly it gave them too much. Of course it was only water, but it was out of a bottle, and I always shook the bottle and counted the drops, which gave it a certain medicinal quality. On this occasion, however, I did not give Peter his draught, for I had just prepared it. I saw a look on his face that made my heart sink. Get your things, Peter, I cried, shaking. No, he answered, pretending indifference. I'm not going with you, Wendy. Yes, Peter, no. To show that my departure would leave him unmoved, he skipped up and down the room, playing gaily on his heartless pipes. I had to run about after him, though it was rather undignified. Yes, Peter, come to find your mother, I coax. Now, if Peter had ever quite had a mother, he no longer missed her. He could do very well without one. He had thought them out and remembered only their bad points. No, no, he told me decisively. Perhaps she would say I was old and I just want always to be a little boy and to have fun. But Peter, no. And so the others had to be told. Peter isn't coming. Peter not coming? They gazed blankly at him, their sticks over their backs, and on each stick a bundle. Their first thought was that if Peter was not going, he had probably changed his mind about letting them go. But he was far too proud for that. If you find your mothers, he said darkly, I hope you will like them. The awfully cynicism of this made a uncomfortable impression and most of them began to look rather doubtful. After all, their faces said, were they not noodles to want to go? Now then, cried Peter, no fuss, no bubbling. Goodbye, Wendy, and he held out his hand cheerily, quite as if they must really go now, for he had something important to do. I had to take his hand, and there was no indication that he would prefer a th thimble. You will remember about changing your flannels, Peter, I said, lingering over him. I was always so particular about his flannels. Yes. And you will take your medicine? Yes. That seemed to be everything. And an awkward pause followed. Peter, however, was not the kind that breaks down before other people. Are you ready, Tinkerbell? He called out. Aye, aye. Then lead the way. Tink had darted up the nearest tree, but no one had followed her. For it was at this moment that the pirates made their dreadful attack upon the natives. Above, where all had been so still, the air was rent with shrieks and the clash of steel. Below, there was a dead silence. Mouths opened and remained open. I fell on my knees and my arms were extended toward Peter. All arms were extended to him as if suddenly blown in his direction. We were beseeching him mutely not to desert us. As for Peter, he seized a sword, the same he thought he had slain barbecue with, and the lust of battle was in his eyes. What happens next? Will we be safe? We'll have to find out next time. 
So until then, stay safe and please take care. Bye.